my friend. Hello. Thank you for coming, joining me in my house for the first live podcast guest. Awesome. Exciting. Um, let's start by telling people how we know each other. Um, <laughs> um, we we know each other from having, well, for me, it was my third MMA fight ever. Uh, I was almost not going to fight two things. One, because I lost my previous, my first two. And then the third one was because I almost killed myself. I had to cut seven pounds the day of um, of weigh-ins and that was excruciating but it happened and we fought and uh since we fought we've been friends on facebook and i've said congratulations on the um the birth of his kids stuff like that but we haven't really fully hung out until probably two weeks ago and we went to a jordan peterson lecture of all things which into itself is so wild to me to think that you would pay money to go see a professor lecture on like a Saturday night or whatever yeah. it was. It's so weird. Um, Thursday night. Thursday night. It was yes. a Thursday night. Thursday night. Yep. Thursday night. So it's kind of improbable that after a fight where I was, I mean, we beat the shit out of each other, but like it ended in me losing with broken ribs and torn whatever the hell I still, don't know how. I still don't know how it happened um they healed weird by the way and so like i can't lay flat because of uh don't say that no no no, no. oh my god I messed up it's my not no i i i probably you know what it probably was i probably had an injury before because yeah. i was trained i was doing like three a day six days a week i was training like an idiot i had no i had no rhyme or reason what i was doing it was just like i'll just go there and be put myself in pain and then like that works right um anyway so i just find it interesting that like we just beat the shit out of each other right and then there was i didn't feel any animosity at all me neither none and my wife was with me and i don't remember what she was like at the moment but i remember afterwards she was like it's the nicest guy I've ever met. What the hell's going on? <laughs> I, it's crazy. Sorry to derail you because, like I say, my ADD and I go on a lot of tangents. But we're in good company then. <laughs> thank you. Um, a coworker, I remember a coworker asked me, he's like, Anthony, why, why'd you fight? Like, you're like a big ass teddy bear, nicest dude ever I ever I ever met. And I'm like, my easiest question without like thinking, I was like, I had a lot of rage. Mm. I just had a lot of rage. I needed to get out to spew out. And um, I took anger management um, when I was younger and stuff. Um, also, along with speech therapy, and that helped me out because um, speech therapy, because I was in a car accident when I was three, and I was in a coma for two and a half months, I think, and I had to learn how to walk and talk to me. So I was in speech therapy from three until I believe 11. Yeah, 11. Oh, wow. That's yeah. actually a long time. Yes. <laughs> um but uh yeah and you you say a car accident that could be you were in a car seat no i actually right, like... was with my favorite sister um you know who you are <laughs> i was with my favorite sister and uh um she had my hand and i i believe my hat flew back and she went to go get it and she let go of my hand and I ran into the middle street. I ran into the middle street. A car hit me with so much velocity. I bounced off the car in front of me, and then I landed on a parked car's windshield. And uh, yeah, I was in a coma um, for two and a half months. Yeah, and uh, it was crazy. And uh, I used not I used that story, but I used that whole yeah use that story because when i get down on dumps or something happens or something like that i'm just like all right and you're strong it's okay look at your mom like she was strong as hell because to make it through that yeah to make it through that because parents get get crazy wild when the kid is sick with a cough for like a day or two but like to go to the hospital every day, to be a mother and go to a hospital every day for two months and not know if your baby's gonna live or die. You you can't imagine, I can't imagine how much strength my mom had to have, mm. you know, how much faith, how much trust in God, how much trust she had in the hospital. Just, 
Yeah, just all that. And then when I think about that, I'm just like, all right, like, you're strong to do this workout. <laughs> yeah, right. You're strong enough <laughs> to get through this one hurdle or something. So, yeah, my mom. And God rest her soul. <laughs> Bless her heart, man. So do you remember waking up from that? No, actually. Um, I remember, um, yeah, I don't really remember waking up for that. I, from that. I remember like little things when I was a kid. Um, I remember having, uh, um, I remember having to obviously, like I said, so go to speech therapy. Um, I remember my mom and my siblings, um, keeping me, inhibiting me from doing like rough sports and stuff because my scar, um, I still think this is a fabricated story that they told me. And I kept saying it, that if I got hit um, on my bump, I would die or something. Or I would get go back in my coma. And oh, shit. Um, obviously, back then, I would, I believed it. And like now, I'm, I don't because I'm 30 something. But anyways, like, um, yeah, um, that inhibited me from, um, cause when I was young, I was, I was 389 pounds. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> You're a tall guy. I was obese. No. Um, at the time I was like probably five. That's not know, tall. Five, 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 six. <laughs> yeah. That's more round than tall. Yes. I was really round. Um, and I was obese and I remember, uh, um, yeah, so I was obese. Um, I don't play my mom. I love her to death, but my mom, I was a baby. Um, and, uh, she would give me, she would make me whatever I wanted and mm. I loved, and I still love today, to date, um, pancakes. So breakfast, lunch, and dinner, pa- pancakes. Oh That's shit. That's all I wanted. And, like, her <laughs> pancakes, like straight from like, she would make it from scratch, like the flour, the butter, the eggs, everything, make it from scratch. So it was like fat, fat pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have that breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And, uh, I was big and, uh. I was 12. I got jumped and stabbed. I was with one of my So friends. where'd you grow up? Oh, in the Bronx. Sorry. Um, um, from New York. Um, lived in the Bronx, born and raised until I was um, 12, 13. And then I moved to Dorchester, Dorchester, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. In retrospect, you're like, Bronx, Dorchester. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, um, that's, yeah, that's what happened. And uh, um, we kept it. I kept it a secret as much as I can with my with my friend because I went straight to his house when you got stabbed. When I got stabbed, because um, he lived on the second floor and I lived on the fifth, so I went straight to his place. Did to, were these people that you knew? Was it like um, a vendetta? Was, were they um, trying to get money? Or was it? No, it was his. I don't give a shit. I'll say his name. His name. His nickname was Bebo. Um, and he was the cousin of this girl who I used to go to Catholic school um, in the Bronx. They lived on the third floor. And um, yeah, and I remember seeing him, blah, blah. And I remember he went to public school, to the public school that I finally went to, PS, MS45, in, seven, in, fifth, in sixth grade. And I remember he was just like, oh, you're talking shit. I'm like, why? I don't even know you. I just know you from like my neighborhood. And uh, yeah, he just picked on me. Him and uh, I think it was two of his brothers and two of his cousins. I remember it was five people and they held me against a wall. They were just like toying with me. I'm a fat little fucker. Um, and they were just toying me. And I, um, the old dude from the corner store, um, Abuelo, <laughs> said, hey, what are you doing? And then I remember pushing, um, getting, getting away, pushing Bebo, and then they just stabbed me. Um, in the back. Jeez. And I remember like, ah, and then I just ran um, or waddled because I was fat and obese still. Um, and I waddled up a hill um, to my apart to my building. And uh, my best friend, my brother, um, Pito, lived on the second floor. So I just chilled with him for a little bit. And then I finally told my sister like two days later, because I have four sisters, um, but I lived with three. And I told how my, old, how old were you? Twelve. I was twelve. Yeah. Did you go to a school nurse or something, or you just have a stab wound that you're just treating with a band aid. I'm just treating with a band aid and stuff. It was yeah. So um, and I remember telling my uh, sister um, 
because I don't want to say her name. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, fuck it. Um, I went to my, um, I told my sister Joanne, and I believe Joanne told my mom, and then my mom was in the talks with my oldest sister and her husband. And I know my my oldest sister's husband was the one who had the idea. Hey, hey, um, let's have anything move in, move up with us. Let's get him out of the Bronx, you know. Mm. So uh, my mom, while so it's because you got stabbed that you moved. I believe so. Yeah. In my head, I believe. So. I mean, that it seems probably, to make sense. Yeah, it was in the works. Yeah, because I remember later on, um, they told me, "Oh yeah, um, Tony, my brother Tony was the one who said who wanted me to move up to Massachusetts." You know, he's like my first, my second dad, kind of, because I moved up with, I moved up here with him and my sister. But uh, yeah, so um, what was it you think that? Obviously, when we're overeating, it's usually because we're something's I'm speaking of somebody who actively overeats, by the way, like in a, like any day of the week. Um, not proud of it. I just I know what it is. Um, it's usually because of some underlying pathology, right? Like some things you're trying to feel good because something else feels bad. Do you know what it was at the time that was driving that? Or is it just kind of? You know, everything man, that's why i love talking to you because not only you bring up some crazy shit that i'm like oh man i gotta deal with it now but it makes you makes me wonder um i don't know i think i attribute it to i was the baby and my mom gave me whatever i wanted said she never said no especially when it comes to food so i would just eat you just milk it surplus, yeah and then i don't know maybe I don't remember. I can't pretty. I can't put a finger on it. Um, I would want to say, "Oh yeah," because I felt inadequate. But what kind of kid? Really yeah, like right. You're just a kid. Um, you don't know any better. It could be. Um, still could be true. Even well, if you couldn't have put your finger on it, then that could still have been yeah. how you felt. Oh well, actually, I we would live. We lived in a bad neighborhood, also. Yeah. So I stayed inside. We never really. Uh, any, we like we weren't go, super active. Yeah, I wasn't super active at all. Um, I remember I got a bike for my eighth birthday, a white bike, and in my apartment building, in my apartment, I rode my bike down the hallway. I was probably like from that wall to here, just that hallway, narrow hallway, and I would scuff up the, the walls, <laughs> but it was okay because I was safe. I was riding my bike there, and my mom let me yep. in the hallways, in the hallway, so um that's really it i think it was just because it was bad neighborhood and plus like i'm my mom's baby um she doesn't want anything bad ever to happen to me because the worst already happened and i'm alive right so she just kept me like closer so to recap for for the listeners three years old you get a fucking yard sailed by a car coma for multiple months yes and then at 12, you get jumped by a crew, yeah. not just a couple of people, yeah. beat the shit out of, no. stabbed. Yeah. And then it's like, okay, we probably should, let's get him out of this situation for a yeah. little bit. Let, let cool off a little bit. Um, I hope, I would hope that was their thinking. Um, I think it was in the works, actually, that, hey, let's get Anthony out of the Bronx or give him a better life because my sister just got an awesome, fantastic job at Boston Medical Center. Um and um we were living in Savin Hill. She was living in Savin Hill with her husband. And uh her husband, Tony, my brother, like he's he's legit. Like I feel like he's my second dad. My I say second dad because my first dad is my older brother Gil. Um but uh um, yeah, Tony was the one who said, hey, how about we get Anthony out of, out of this situation and give him a better life? So, yeah. Um, do, you think was the, do you think that was the right call? Yes, totally. Good. Um, way right call. Because not just speaking about like how my life has, um, has gone on now, but it's just, yeah, I honestly think I would have either not been dead because I didn't roll with tough crowds, but... I probably would have already been shot multi or shot at or shot or been in worse trouble or been in jail because I was stupid. You know how kids are dumb mm-hmm. and they just <laughs> follow the crowd. I would have done something stupid or I would have 
had a dead end job trying to struggle living in the Bronx. And like, yeah, it was cool. I'll admit, like, I always said, oh man, I want to move back to New York and blah, blah, and stuff like that. I think that changed for me, that whole like, oh, uh, I'm not ever moving back to New York. Um, I think that changed for me, I don't know, um, probably when I was like 20 something. Yeah. Because I've been back and forth from here to New York. Um, we are, uh, so I got, got stabbed, all that stuff, moved to Dorchester. Then we moved to Attleboro. Um, because my sister found my sister and her husband found a house, beautiful house, and they domesticated me because <laughs> I started mowing the lawn, um, <laughs> mowing the lawn, doing chores, and having errands, walking the dog. This is so, unusual for a thirteen-year-old yes, man. Exactly, <laughs> you know, especially from, from from the Bronx. Um, and uh, it was crazy. I started, and like I, I attribute like how I am a lot, mostly to both my father figures, but mostly, um. My uh, my brother-in-law because he's from Texas, so in Texas football is a religion. It's a way of life. So I remember he's like, I don't care. You're not gonna quit. You're gonna do it for one season, and uh, and if you don't like it, don't do it after. But you're gonna do it one season. So I did football in high school. In well, eighth grade there was no football, but in at our, um in Coelho there was no there was football like playing um two hands two hand touch in the recess, but. Um, when it came to high school, my brother, my brother-in-law told me like, "Hey, you're gonna do football. You're not gonna quit. If you don't like it by the end of the season, don't do it again. But you're gonna do it." And that's like, yeah. So I started. I well, not just that, but actually, sorry, I go on mad tangents. But when I moved to Dorchester, the first thing that my sister said to me because I was fat, I was obese, was um verbatim and she laughs because she knows it too so if she, listens, <laughs> if she hears this she'll laugh her ass off verbatim she said listen anthony you're fat you hyperventilate when you walk up steps and we only live on the second floor god damn anthony from now on you eat what i cook and if you don't like what i cook go to bed hungry and like i'll admit like i was 13 I went to bed hungry some days. Oh, right. I like, no, I want some pancakes for dinner. Or no, I want KFC original recipe. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. Original recipe is better. I'm with you. Better than crispy. But anyways, like, so my sister enhanced my palate by um not just like also I learned a lot of responsibility. Seventh grade, um, I would get home fat, I would get home first before my sister and my brother. So I would make it my my Aaron was make a salad for dinner and stuff. So I would make a like house salad and we all three of us would eat at, at the table, um at at the table, um eating dinner and stuff. And uh salad with lunch and dinner. And uh I started eating fish, baked chicken. Um when I say enhance I enhanced my palate, I uh, started having food out of my realm, which is you know, my room was just pancakes and grilled <laughs> cheese. So I started having Indian food. Um, wow, that's a big deal. Everything, just like enhancing, um, expanding my horizons. Because my sister, I was like their first son, <laughs> basically. So how much older was she? Um, oh shit, I don't remember. Sorry. Um, now okay, I'm 33 and she's 53, 54. Okay, so 20 years, so yeah. quite a bit older. Yeah, so she was like. My second mom. Yeah. Um. So, and that was her first kid. Um. So you got a, a a really great foundation of unconditional love. Yes, totally. And then cast probably at the perfect time because at twelve thirteen yeah. is right when you really need some discipline in your life, yes. right? Because if you're a young man and you start producing testosterone <laughs> and you don't have discipline, shit's gonna get weird quick. Yeah. Yeah. And I hated discipline. I still, well, I don't still hate this one, but a lot of people would argue that it's a struggle. This one. Yes, it's a struggle. Um, and uh, I didn't like authority. And I remember my brother in law, because he was in the Navy, later on, um, went to the Army, and then, um, but was in the Navy, and he's from Texas, the way he was raised. So he would be like Mr. Disciplinary. Mm. And uh, tell you the truth, I didn't like it, obviously, because I'm right. 13, I'm stupid and ignorant. But uh, yeah, I needed that and stuff and uh they got me into sports so i lost weight i remember let's fast forward to fresh 
freshman year, freshman going into sophomore, I remember I always joke about this. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm 15, I'm 16. I'm in, I was in my prime because I had a six pack. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, so wait a second. So you went from 385 pounds to a no, six pack? Sorry, 389 yes. pounds yeah. to was, a six pack in three years? Um, yeah, I, turned, I was 221.9. And so at that time, you're what, six foot, six two? Um, six, six foot, I think, yeah, six foot. 220, that's, that's, yeah. a, that's a rip. That is an yeah. enormous high school student. Because I was doing football. Um, football, um, the next season, I didn't do, I did winter track for like, I, I just um, immersed myself into sports because my sister and my brother-in-law changed my life. Honestly, I owe it to them. Um I probably still would be fat as shit right now. So isn't that interesting? You know, let, we should talk about that yeah. specifically yes. because in the woke, whatever the hell environment we're in right now, right? Yeah. Like even using the word fat is probably like, I'm already canceled because I said <laughs> the word. And it's interesting to me because you were going to die young. Probably. Not probably. You're almost 400 pounds at, like 13, you were going to die young for sure you were. So I think that in our attempt to escape the hyper-masculine society that we found ourselves in, in the late 20th century, I think we over-rotated and, and decided that like no masculinity was allowed. So like no judgment, no no stiff hand of the law or whatever. Yeah. And Pansies. yeah. And uh, I think that's ultimately somehow like the product can look like that, yeah. but I think it's the balance of both where it's like the reason why they were sharing that with you was because they loved you. Oh, it's like, okay. wake the fuck up. You're killing yourself. And I'm so concerned about you that I'm going to let you starve Instead of letting you poison yourself, because I'm strong enough to handle the hurt. Because think about what it takes for her to do that, right? She's got to watch you starve at night and, and the tears and the rage and everything that comes out of that. And for her to stand her ground because she loves you enough that she wants you to heal, that's a big deal. Yeah. And that is that to me is the blend of the masculine and feminine. It's like it's the the empathy and the love. And the willingness to sacrifice yourself in service to the other person, but it's also like the strong arm of the law. Like I'm in fucking charge. I'm the grown up. You're a kid. You have no idea what you're doing. You're killing yourself, right? And it's like those things at the same time. That to me is um, the art that has been lost in the attempt to purify just, everything. Yeah, especially with this generation. I think it's been happening for a series of generations. Um, and it's tough to even tell what generation is even responsible for what components of things right now, because I have a lot of um, like friends and mentees at work who are, you know, in their mid twenties, let's say mid late twenties. And I am frequently astonished at how mature they are in many regards and then at the same time, I'll find people who are in their 30s, and it's like they have arrested development in yeah. virtually every regard. And it's like, what the hell happened? Like, where did you? It's like you got locked in a room. They don't know who they are. Yeah, that's a really, um, what a powerful and simple way of saying it. Yeah. But I feel like nobody, well, actually, uh, I'm playing devil's advocate. Um, a part of me feels like at a certain age, or well, well, not at a certain age, but like I feel like you have to know who you are. But are you ever knowing who you are? Because you're always changing, like every single day. Um, well, because you aren't changing. So, if in the in the um, traditional sense of that, meaning if you're a Christian, yes. then you believe you're the soul, yes. and the soul is the thing that sits behind the mind, the body, and the emotions. And the soul is indelible. The soul doesn't change. The soul is there when you're born. 
the soul is there. It's the same one when you're one, when you're 10, and when you're 100. What, the stuff that's changing is just your equipment, mm. right? But the soul never changes. And so I think you can realize that. And then when you do, the whole game changes because now there's not so much to panic about because this, to me at least, what I've observed is it appears that this is untouchable meaning it's transcendent to everything in this realm. There's an, it's like, <clears throat> it would be the equivalent of if I drew, um, if I drew a warrior on a piece of paper, it would be the equivalent of me being afraid of that warrior. It's like, it's, it's trapped in that realm. Everything we see and experience is trapped in the realm that it's in. Mm -hmm. And your consciousness is above all of it and sees all of it in the same way you are above mm -hmm. the paper. Yeah. And um, so if, if that's true, and this is what I think all of the, the great spiritual practices have, have tried to convey, whether it's Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, Judaism, Christianity, all of it, is that we are, we are children of God. And as such, you don't have anything to worry about. So stop fucking stressing out. And I know that that sounds preposterous because there's so much to stress about. And my body is riddled with anxiety all the time. But I also know in my, in my soul level, in the consciousness, that there's nothing to worry about. Hmm. And so every day for me is a dance of getting worked up and then just... It's like, I'll just, something will ping me right out of, out of nowhere, just hit me and everything's, everything just cinches up. You get that fight or flight kind of response. And then it's just a matter of like, first of all, what was that? Like, why did that happen? And do you have time for that? Right. Because if I'm in the middle of a phone call at work, I can't exactly, you know, do a deep dive analysis on what's going on. But if it's a Saturday afternoon and the kids just did or said something or Meg or whatever, then yeah, maybe I'll take a few minutes and try and figure out like, why am I so pissed about something that's obviously so stupid? I think that's also self-realization. Yeah. And that's, so when we talk about like, can you ever really know yourself? I don't know to what extent you can, but I do think you can at least know what you're not. Yes. And I think that matters. I like that. So maybe you never know what you are, but you can, t you can figure out what you're not. And then if you figure out what you're not, then you don't have to be so attached to the thoughts and emotions, yeah. right? It's just like, they're just happening in front of you. It's yeah. like, it's information, it's data. It's like an email. Yeah. It's like, here's an email that says some stuff. You can fucking delete it. Spam, archive, lot, goodbye. <laughs> like how you said, uh, um, like if something with your kids or your wife and you just, and then something just hits you and you're like, what the fuck am I worrying about? Fuck it, leave it. That's how I feel like I am 98% of my life. Um, like when I get into little tiffs with my wife, um, even when she was my fiance or my girlfriend and stuff, or like not even that. Um, and just like bad shit would happen to me. I was just like, all right, like whatever. What's the, what's the worst that could happen? Um, there's like, a few quotes that I live by, um, and uh, my my sister-in-law. So, a quick quick rundown. So, I lived uh, I lived in Dorchester, moved to Attleboro, lived in Attleboro, went there for eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade. Then, uh, um, somewhere I think it was in May, because I had only a month and some change left, sophomore year. I was stupid and ignorant. Um, as we all are. As, as all I, young men are. <laughs> um, so after 9-11 happened, my brother got activated and went to, um, I got activated and yep. went overseas. So it was just me, my sister Lisa, and she was pregnant with my first half nephew. So she needed help. Yeah. So my mom. Um, and you're how old at this time? Um, 14. Okay. 14. So you've been, you've been up here for a couple of years? Yeah. So. Um, because of that, my mom moved up here to um, help Lisa oh, and be with me also. Nice. So it was cool. So it was just us three and the baby that's in her belly. And uh, um, 
um, then my something, something, a family, big family incident happened, which probably we'll discuss later, but <clears throat> that my, so I'm the baby. So the second youngest sibling, my sister, she moved up here um, also. So we are all five, all four of us and the baby was living in the house. <clears throat> um, my sister Joanne got an apartment in Pawtucket, which was probably 10, 15 minutes from Attleboro. Uh, I was stupid with my brother-in-law um, and Caddy. I remember eating all his yodels in the uh, yodels, um, the chocolate Twinkies in my head, I put it. Um, I remember eating all his yodels and leaving the wrappers in the box Oof. just to piss him off on Oof. purpose. I'm a piece of shit. I still regret <laughs> the fact that I did that. So I did that, and he was just like, hey, what the hell are you, you were, you were, You were very cleverly <laughs> trying to figure out how can I make him the most pissed. Yes. And so yeah. it's kind of genius if you think about it. <laughs> it is. Because if they were just yes. gone, then he there's all kinds of things. He could have just been like, did I not buy those? Or, yes. Right? It's like, no. It's like, damn, I mother. Know I yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like, I feel like that's how I am all the time now. Or all yeah. So uh, anyway, so I did that. And then I remember I'm on my, on my laptop. On so you think some of the confidence is coming from the fact that you're now six foot, 225, jacked up? Um, no. Well, I would say yes, but no, not really. Uh, the... The, I had no confidence still. Hmm. Um, I didn't take off my shirt still at that time. Interesting. I had my first ever girlfriend, and I remember like I took my shirt off once and stuff. But anyways, um, I wasn't that confident. It was more so I'm Anthony Soda, and I could do what the fuck I want because I don't give a shit. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> you know? And like this was way before I fought in the cage, but it's like, what's the worst that could happen? I'll be, get beat up. I guess that so it's when, happened before. When was that what's the worst that could happen attitude first start, you think? Um, I don't know. Um, I want to say probably when I was 16 because I remember when I would, uh, I lived with my brother. Um, I lived with my brother in Newburgh, New York. And uh, my sis, my, my sis law was the good cop. You know how uh, yeah, yeah. good cop, bad cop. My brother was more like, like disciplinary disciplinary pin me a mexican he tells you to do something you fucking do it and stuff or you get yelled at or whatever so and my sister-in-law was closer to my age kind of she um i forget the age difference probably like seven or eight years or whatever but she was closer to me and she was okay with me she had a brother who was my age also so she was the good cop that would be like oh yeah christy like can you can you ask her this blah blah? And she would always be like, "Anything, just go ahead and ask him. Like, go ahead. What's the worst that could happen? No, you're at ground zero. You're back where you started. It's right. okay. So like, I think it started then, but then again, it started like like I told you that story um, with my bum law eating the yodels. It was just I did it because I was a not smug piece of shit, but I was like all like I was just young and dumb. When I was that age. I um I was so hurt that I came off I think as a narcissist. Um, well, because I needed everything to go my way. Because if it didn't, my life was hell. Because my life was hell. Yeah. Um, psychologically speaking, my actual physical life it wasn't the best, but it wasn't actually hell. Like yeah. I wasn't living in Ukraine, getting fucking shelled by a neighbor, right? Yeah. So, um. But you don't know that when you're 10, right? You don't know what relativity means. All you know is that you're in hell hmm. because you're 10. And you're just in your own bubble. That's it. And you don't know anything. You have no capacity to understand anything about anything, right? You went from a blob. You, you could get put into this world with infinite capacity and an empty database. And it's just like, good luck. Oh. And you just bump into shit until you figure out how to communicate with the rest of the world. That's an interesting way to put it. And most simplistic way to put it. Well, I think that I don't remember if I've talked to anybody else about this on this podcast or not, but my notion of original sin is that everything was the Garden of Eden before because the Garden of Eden and heaven, I think, are when you don't ever have to make any decisions. 
There's no choices to make. So all of nature is perfect because there are no choices to make. My dog doesn't make any choices. Everything is predefined. If this, then that. Every time you do a, a certain, you provide a certain stimulus, you're guaranteed to get the same response. There's no choice. There's no consciousness where like they don't have the thing that is transcendent. They can't change the world with their thoughts. They are just of the world. And the fall, the fall in the garden, um, I think it's a I think it's a story, a parable meant to explain like what happened. What happened when we went from monkeys to people? And you went from having no no choices, no power to infinite choices, infinite power. Sure. And that's the darkness. The darkness is here is the power of God, and there's no fucking manual. <laughs> Good luck, pumpkin. And so what do we do? We do all the wrong things because we don't know what we're doing. And I think that it's why it's original sin is that all people, all humans are born with this sin because you can't possibly know anything with an empty database. And that's what you're born with. Babies have nothing. You've got the, you have the primitive, the animal part, the DNA, the if this, then that, the you touch a hot stove, you, you pull your hand away, right? All of that is pre programmed. But all the other stuff, all the thoughts, the beliefs, the myths, all of that is learned and it starts at nothing, absolutely nothing. So you can't know anything, it's impossible. And as a, as a human, because you don't know anything, when something happens and, and you get that vibration that's an emotion and you don't, when you're a child, you don't know what to do with emotions because you have no coping mechanisms because you've learned nothing because your database is empty. And so that's when you start storing all that shit because there's nothing else you can do with it. How could you deal with it? You don't, you don't have the maturity. You don't have the knowledge. And so I think that that's why everybody needs to atone, repent, whatever for their sins, because the, the sin really is that you didn't know how to be the divine thing that you really are, which is to just be witness to the universe. And instead, there's a guy, Michael Singer, who wrote this book, The Untethered Soul, which I've talked about before, and he equates it to there's, there's somebody throws a rock into the pond. And you're sitting on the dock watching this beautiful still pond. Someone throws a rock into it, which is the equivalent of like you've got somebody triggered you, right? Yeah. Like something's happened and, you're, and now you're, you're activated. And, there's a ripple in. and so what you do then is you jump off the fucking dock and you start smoothing out the water, trying to get it to, to calm down. Yeah. And it's like, well, of course that doesn't work. But that's the equivalent of what you trying to control the universe is. Huh. It's like you can't. Okay. You're making a mess of everything. Yes. So just chill. Just chill. <laughs> just let Jesus take the wheel, yeah. right? It's like just be quiet enough, have enough faith that in the moment, when the moment demands something of you, you will be there to answer the call. That to me is what faith is. It's that I don't need to be worrying about the future, worrying about the past, because I know that I have such grand power in the now. So if I'm in the now and I listen, listen, I'm yeah. still enough that I can intuit what the next thing is every moment forever. And I think that's what flow state looks like is when, because think about it, when you're fighting, yeah. right? When you're making love, when you're dancing, you're playing music, you lose yourself, right? That's the ego. The ego is this false thing that you get tricked into thinking is you, right? It's the soul is gets that's the um that's the original sin is that the ego gets constructed in front of you and you get tricked into thinking this mask is you for the rest of your life until you until you wake up and at least peel it away from your face enough that you can breathe. And that's what I feel like I started doing a couple of years ago. And then it's like a slow, like, okay, can you get it? Can you get it off? Yeah.
But from what you just said, I love it. Um, but let me ask you: Do you think ego is a bad thing? Because the way yeah, you... I do. Yeah. And the reason why is bad. It's a tough word. Um, Not bad. Um, I think it's a suboptimal thing. If you had, if you had to choose between having an ego or not, not having it would be a more optimal decision. Course, yeah. Now, the reason why that is is the only thing anyone has ever given a fuck about is the feeling that happens when your energy is flowing through your body. That's the only thing anyone has ever cared about. So when you ate your pancakes, the reason that you ate them is because it made your energy flow. Yeah, the endorphins. reason, exactly. <laughs> when the reason why, well, the endorphins are part of the system that propels it, right? Um, I believe that there's another set of energy that we can't see. That's the whole like Chinese medicine type of thing. Yep. Um, but who knows? It could just be a biochemical thing. But regardless, it's the feeling you get the way that your body perceives whatever the hell, all that combination of sensorial information, that's what you really care about when the juice is flowing, right? That's why you want the hug. That's why you want, that's why when, you know, a pretty girl looks at you, right? It's like something happens inside of you that makes that stuff flow. So that's the only thing you've ever cared about from the moment you were born. Because when somebody, you know, fed you or held you or changed you, that's what was happening. That reward system. What's that? That reward system. A reward system, exactly. Um, and that's all pretty to that still. And what the ego does is when you were born and you didn't know what you were, your mind starts to create a map and tells you stories. And that story, that primary story is about who you are. And that's what the ego is. The ego is a story about who you are. You're a soul. That's it. And what you think you are is a 30-something-year-old man who's X height and blah, blah, and was born a certain way and all these things that happened to you. Those aren't you. That is stuff that you witnessed on your journey, but it's not actually you. Sure. <laughs> this this is my fucking head blew off my shoulders yeah. a couple of years ago. This all came from this book, The Untethered Soul. It's the whole opening of the book starts with who are you, really, and it, it takes you down the journey of like, well, you can't be a thirty year old man because you were a one year old and then a ten year old, so you can't be different things. So what are you? What is the thing that was one and then ten and then thirty? What is it that knows? that you did or didn't dream. What is that? And that's what, that's when it's just like, oh, that's the soul. Holy shit. And that's when you can say, oh, that's the Atman. That I think that's a Hindu thing, right? And it's like, yeah. all of a sudden you see all the religions, all the different spiritualities all point back to the same thing. They just have a different way of talking about it. And for some reason, that different way of talking about it was worth like going around the world and killing each other for a very long time. It's a little bit perplexing if you think about it, like at a macro level, but yes. whatever, fucking shit happens. I remember uh, Penn Oswald had a comedy bit that he said religion fucked the soul up. Mm. And like, I I can't, I don't want to, for the sake of it, I don't want to fuck it up. But basically, um, he said something like, religion is like saying, oh, there's a sky wizard that will do this. And if you do something bad, it will eat you up and it will scare people. And this religion is, uh, they love cake. And if you're against cake, fuck you. And if you're against this guy, was it fuck you? Yeah, we'll go back and forth. Something like that. I'm, I'm just paraphrasing. But yeah, it's interesting. It's like that's why. Like, um, I grew up Roman Catholic, but um, and I still believe in God. I have so much faith. When shit happens, I'm just like, all right, shit. What? I'll be okay. Like in my head, um, I don't think I'm. I talk to myself honestly. I, as crazy as it sounds, or as actually, it's not crazy. Fuck you. Fuck anyone who thinks I'm crazy. But um, I feel like I'm talking to God when I don't feel like I'm talking to myself, my conscience, or, or talk to myself. I feel like when I'm doing decisions, when I'm driving home, or when I'm just talking to myself, I'm talking to God. So that I feel like I'm always praying. I don't feel like, yes, sometimes, like when 
when I'm down in dumps or I'm thinking about somebody who I love or my wife or I want to bless us, like I do the whole like um 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 the, all that the whole cross thing and stuff, and I pray. But uh, I believe I I'm talking to him all the time. Um, that's I'm not talking to my conscious. I'm talking to him. I'm having a conversation with him. Uh, my wife hates it when I always joke about it because she's she's Christian or she got she was raised Seven Day Adventist Christian. Mm-hmm. So like she hates when I'm joking about it, and I'm always like, yeah. Jesus is my homie. Like, I talk to him all the time. Like, don't you lose the Lord's name in vain and blah, blah. That's blasphemy. Gee, all this stuff. But I honestly believe that. That's why I feel like I have so much faith. I walk with so much faith. Um, and I know who I am, even though despite with what you yeah. just said, with what you said, but I know who I am and I know my heart, my soul. So You've had a lot of time to contemplate things. Yes. Yeah. And like, especially the days or especially when something bad really happens to me or the days after. I was just talking about it with my uh, God, with my godmother, who I, I call mom, when I talk to her on the phone. And I've told you this previously, like, um, <clears throat> I would lie to myself. So on one story, um, I love my family to death. I love all my siblings, even though my sister Joanne has this on me. So... I um, will try not to say names, but I will say my sister Joanne because fuck it, she just on me for stupid ass reasons. Um, mostly because my wife is black. Um, but anyways, whatever. I digress. So um, my my uh, I remember when I moved to, back to New York, this altercation happened. Blah blah. I got kicked out the house. I was um, my mom um, came down from. On from Attleboro to the Bronx to my godmother's house. Um, my godmother's mom is named Juanita. So Juanita took me and my mom in her van from the Bronx to Newburgh, and we're talking. We're, we're at my brother's house, and uh, um, he's Mister Disciplinary. So maybe he'll, if he ever listened to this, he'll be like, "Oh, that never happened," or maybe he's like, "Hey, that happened, whatever," because he owns his 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 mistakes and stuff. But yeah, so. They, they, he has us in the house, just me and my mom, Juanita's in her van, chilling outside the training. And he has my games, my, my games, my video, my, my games, my DVDs, and one porno that I had <laughs> on, out on the, on the table. He's like, this is what your son spends money on games, movies, porno. And I'm like, oh. I was more distraught because he he put my point on. I would and, be too. Yeah, Shit. That point on. How old were you? Um, I was 15. I would have died. Yeah. <laughs> and that point on was in my DVD TV. So he attempt, he purposely took ejected it, out, it. Ejected oh, man. it and put it on the, on the coffee table. And I'm like, oh my God, my mom thinks I'm a heathen now. But, anyways, so he's just like, yeah, this is what. So, long story short, um, my mom tells my brother that he has to still live with you because he's going through, he's going, he's in school and blah, blah, blah. Oh, correction. I was 16. Cause I moved to New, back to New York at 16. So sorry for that. I don't want to seem like I'm lying. I was 16, 17 cause junior year. Um, and, uh, so anyways, I'm living there. <clears throat> I, I, I'm, I got allowed to come back or whatever. And I remember staring at my window crying, um, because my, I see Juanita driving my mom, they come, go, they're um, reversing out the driveway and I'm crying, like, oh my God, um, I'm going to be here, blah, blah, and stuff like that, blah, blah. And I remember lying to myself. And I think this is where um, where my whole thought process of getting past difficult shit in my life had happened or started is because I lied to myself saying, hey, Anthony, you've been through worship before, even though I have not. But I said, you've been through worship before. You're going to laugh about this. In two days, two weeks, you're going to laugh about this. It's okay, Anthony. It's all right. And like, I calm myself down. So where do you think that came from? uh, I don't know. Um, Um, That's an unusual coping skill for six, an angry 16 year old man. uh, Right. Young man. Cause I was a man Um, by distinction, by my meaning. Because my meaning of a man is someone who could provide, who could um, take care of, 
who could not only take care of himself, but his loved ones, physically, mentally, emotionally, financially, all that stuff. And my definition of a man, I said, I'm a man after my mom passed away because I, I obviously I didn't take care of her financially and stuff, but we've shared so many stories between each other that like, it'll like, we've shared so much and I was there with her all the time and stuff. And, um, I knew she loved me. I'm not going to go to say like, Oh, I was her favorite and stuff, but, um, she loved me a lot and she told me a lot of stuff and I told her a lot of stuff. I was never, I would never lie to her. Even when I snuck out of my, so, um, sorry, I'm um, back to the story. Yodel's brother-in-law gets in my face. He's like, what happened? I can tell you, blah, blah. Me being an idiot saying, don't put your finger in my fucking face, um, Tony. And he grabbed my finger and twisted it. And I just raged out, mm. picked him up, grabbed him. I'm, I'm big as shit. Right. Um, so I picked him up, grabbed him, slammed him on the, on, on my futon and started punching him. And my sister was superhuman strength, comes downstairs with her baby and the um, Tyler. She swings me to the, to the uh, wall. feels like I'm in the matrix. Swings me to the wall. <laughs> She's like, get out of my house, blah, blah, and stuff like that. And, and which sister is this? Um, my oldest sister. Okay. The one who moved me up from the Bronx to Dorchester to Adam. So one you're good with at the time. Yes. And stuff. And uh, I'm still good with now. Um, and the guy, and, the, and the, that guy, is he the one who's in the Navy? Um, yes. Okay. And then um, he switched to the Army um, afterwards, also like that. Um, I still love him to death. I still regret doing that, honestly, because yeah. I was dumb. And I regret mostly um, not just that situation, but um, my brother-in-law, I don't know. I love him to death, man, because two days later, Oh, the next day I had an appointment. He picked me up from school. He could have been like, fuck you, Anthony. I'm not going to do anything for you, Anthony. You you punched me. You fought me, blah, blah. But he picked me up from school and took me to my appointment in Boston. And while it was me and him driving, he said, hey, do you want me to talk to Lizette so you could so she could let you back in the house? And me being an idiot, so like, I... Didn't answer at first. I'm like, no, that's okay. I'm good. I'm fucking good. And stuff like that. Meanwhile, I'm like, I don't, Anthony, you don't curse to adults. You don't curse to your brother-in-law. Like, what the hell? And stuff. But yeah, I said that. And then because of that, I lived with my mom and my sister um, who moved up from New York. They lived in the house. But when my brother-in-law came back, they moved to Pawtucket, which is 10 minutes away. And I um, lived with them for a couple months. Um, and I kept running past it because Pawtucket's right on the line where out of is. So I would run to my, to my then girlfriend's house to take her bus to keep going to out high school for my sophomore year. Wow. I'd wake up at 4.30 in the morning and run. Wait, how bus. far was it? Um, it was probably like a 10 minute walk and stuff. Oh. Um, well, so why'd you have to get up at 4.30 in the morning? Oh, because buses um, to shower, to get ready, and then give me time to walk over to a house and chill with my then girlfriend a little bit and then take her bus. Um, cause buses would pick you up at five fifty. Whoa. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Really? Five fifty. Why was it so early? I've never heard of that. Um, yeah. Jesus. It would pick you up at five fifty. How far, how far of a uh, bus ride was it? Um, I don't know. At that time, I don't know. 20 minutes. Cause huh. it was from where. So you started school at six thirty. Six thirty. Yeah. We would have to Damn. be there and stuff. Yeah, and then yeah, and then we had. Um, they used to call it the pit, or they still call it the pit, where all the buses would drop off yeah, everybody, yeah. and then wait until the school bell rings at seven to go in and stuff. And I remember, on um, quick side note, because my ADD I'm, and tangents, um, there were potheads. People would um, sneak to this big rock to smoke weed and stuff like that. And I would, my little thing would, um, cause I'm a hustler, I always sell shit and flip stuff. My mom would buy me BJ um, assorted um, candies and like the Reese's peanut butter cups comes in two peanut butter, um, yeah. comes in a package, two peanut butter cups. I would sell them purposely to the potheads for $3 or three fifty, dollars because they're not going to, they just smoked weed. They just smoked. They have the munchies. They're not going to wait until twelve fifty for lunch period. Nice. So I would sell them. And I remember my freshman year, I made $350, $50 
And then I had my first ever girl from my freshman year, and all that went away in two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> Taking her to the movies, uh, treating her. The dumb um, stuff we do. Yeah, I know, right? A, a good life lesson. But uh, yeah. Let, let me hit you with a hustler story real yes. quick. Right. Um, similar thing. So I was, I was in the Army, uh, National Guard, oh. infantry. And so I was at basic training, and in the infantry, this is what they did at the time. So this would have been the year 2000. They had what's called one station unit training. Also, which is normally your, your basic training is I think only like eight weeks. And then you go to what's called advanced individual training, AIT. And that depending on if you're a medic or you're, you know, satellite operator, whatever you're going to go do. So the basic training is you need to know how to be, you know, generally combative right you need to know how to fire a rifle you need to know basic like land navigation skills just like simple stuff right and then the advanced stuff is like okay now go learn what you're going to actually do in the army and if you're in the infantry one station unit training then they combine those two things together so you have and so in in basic training that's really when you have the drill sergeants who are the hard asses like the stuff you see in the movies yes. in the infantry you have 17 weeks of the same drill sergeants. And what also is different is that in basic training, like you get no time off, no phone calls, maybe like one phone call on a weekend, like once a week or every couple of weeks or whatever, but like pretty damn strict stuff. Once you get to advanced individual training, it's just, it's just like normally being on a bear. At least this is what I've heard. I haven't, I wasn't in it, but I couldn't tell you. Um, so anyway, so now we're at the tail end of our, you know, 15 weeks, maybe. Um, and it's Thanksgiving and we get, a, we get a pass, which we get four hours. We get to leave the base, which is like unfucking fathomable for <laughs> us at this time. So we go offsite and now I decide that I'm going to use this opportunity to make a little bit of extra money. So we do two things. The first thing I do is I go to GNC and I buy, um, energy pills which uh, had a Fedra and all this other stuff yeah. in it, right? So like real energy pills. <laughs> I take those back. Um, the other thing, well, actually I'll, I'll complete that story first. So we go on this crazy like 25 mile march as part of like your final field exercise. You march out 25 yes. miles, you know, you get your pack and your okay. all your gear and everything. And I don't know, the packs are maybe 30, 50 pounds. It's not terribly heavy, but I mean, it's pretty heavy for going 25 miles. And, you know, what's interesting about it is you've got all these things that you're, you technically learned during basic training, but maybe you learned it once and you're sure should not proficient enough that when it gets thrown at you randomly mm -hmm. after you haven't slept for two days, that like you're going to be able to execute on it. So that we're, and I was the platoon leader at the time, which is a hilarious story that I can unfold another time. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm 17 years old. I'm in charge of 60 people. And some of them are 30 years old, because if you're in the National Guard, you can kind of join whenever, as long yeah. as you're under, I think, 35. So it old. was a, a completely bizarre scenario. And so, like, we're marching down the street, and all of a sudden, they just, like, pretend that we've been struck by an airstrike. And they, like, come over, and they're like, all right, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And all of a sudden, I've got to coordinate all these people to get the hell out of there. Anyway, it was really bananas and extremely challenging. But um, okay. I was selling these uh okay. energy pills to people because obviously people are fucking exhausted you're at the end of months of this shit we've marched the fuck out there and you gotta march back yeah. um anyway so i get caught with that somebody fucking ratted me out snitches now what you don't know is that the risk associated with this is that you get what's called recycled which means that you have to go back and start over and it's not optional. So what, over the Basic, mile or the no, no, no. All of it. Jeez. So I could have gone back 15 weeks. Now, I was already enrolled at Northeastern University. Yeah. So that would have meant I would have had to like completely change everything. Like My whole life would have completely shifted to make a couple of bucks off of selling this um, these, pills. these pills, right? Now, that's – so. The drill sergeant comes and, and says, Hey, I hear you're selling drugs, private. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, like this is this is a worst case scenario. Yeah. So my heart rate's, I don't know, 250 yeah. at this point. And so I get walked up back to the barracks. Now it's just him. Now he is somebody who was 
I don't even know if he was a drill sergeant of my platoon, actually, to be honest with you. Um, but we go back up to the barracks. He makes me open my my locker. I show him the pill. Now it's it's yeah. from GNC, yeah. right? So it's possible. so it's like now these are really powerful things. But like yeah. he's not a scientist. He doesn't know. He's not a nutritionist, right? right? Yeah, so it has know. GNC on it. I show it to him. He confiscates it. Hold on for a second. Yeah, I gotta pee. You go Sorry. for it. I've been really, and I wanted you to finish. Your yeah, yeah. Let's go. You can slice it all up. Ooh. That was good. You know when you're just holding it in? Oh, yeah. Like you got to go. So, so, he so, this, goes so, so he goes to my locker, confiscates the pills, and it turns out to be a non issue. He just, like, that's the end of it. I don't even know if he told anybody about it. I don't. So, super easy. So, that happens. And at the same time, I have a cell phone in my locker. It or maybe bad. it was under my bed. Oh, oh, this is, so this is like, either 99 or 2000 no it's 2000 so like first of all cell phones aren't really a thing right like this is like the time of like star tech like flip phones like this is like super early everything was pay by the minute kind of shit so it was like 25 cents a minute maybe or 10 cents a minute i can't really remember i had but i got a sprint phone so in the four hours that we were at this mall yeah i went to sprint got a phone got a plan Right, Hi, smuggle the ship back. Holy shit! And now, I'm selling minutes for a dollar a minute shit. in the supply closet or the like. The, so yeah. respectable, dude. I made hundreds and hundreds of dollars because people are like missing the shit out of their families. Yeah, right. And I'm raking them over the coals for it, but like. I had supply and demand. I had the only supply. I could charge whatever the fuck I wanted. I could charge five bucks a minute. They would have said nothing to say about it. And it's just, it's so wild to think about the risk level associated with that. Because if I had gotten caught with that, they w- I'm pretty sure they would have recycled me. Yeah. They were like, that's too bold. You tried too much. You t- like, I respect the swing of the bat, but like, you fucking. I respect that. That's dope. <laughs> So anyway, that the hustler story made me think. Um, That's awesome. I don't know if I want to say fondly, but yeah. Actually, you know what? Let me tell you a couple more things. Yeah. So when I was sixteen, I um, I worked at McDonald's, and the reason I I worked at McDonald's because I left the restaurant that I was um, bussing tables and um, washing dishes at, and at that place I would go in. They'd pick me up. They the owners lived up the street from me. They picked me up at like three thirty on a Friday and I'd work till like two in the morning on Saturday. Yes. And then they'd come back, they'd bring me home. They come back the next day, Saturday morning at like 10 30, 11 o'clock in the morning. So I've slept maybe six hours and then I'd work till two in the morning again. So this is, I'm like 14, 15 years old. So I'm making crazy ass money because I'm I'm hustling like crazy. And all these waitresses are like tipping me out because yeah. I'm like this, you know, little she, kid. Just she, yeah, it was like, dude. I'm right. telling you right now, though, there was definitely a woman there. I can't remember her name. She, I was, I was 14, 15, maybe 16 at the oldest, and this woman was definitely grabbing my ass. <laughs> and it's just funny to think because I was so terrified because I was like, what am I going to do with this? Like, because yeah. there's nowhere for me to take this, no, no. right? Because what? In what universe am I going to translate this into a sexual encounter? You're yeah. double my age, right? And so, but I wasn't mad about it. But I also I had no idea what the yeah. hell to do with it. Anyway, that's funny. Um, nothing like a little sexual assault when you're a teenager. Anyway, <laughs> so so I go and I I go from this hustling environment in this restaurant where like I didn't sit down for my whole shift. I ate standing up. And it was a tiptoe sprint back and forth. Everything I did, I soaked through my clothes with sweat as I'm working at the line, like two hands for everything. And then I go to McDonald's because it was right down the street from my house. I could walk, ride my bike sit down, and I could get, but no, that was, had nothing to do with oh. it. I wanted more hours. I just wanted more, yeah. more money. Okay. And, you know, I didn't have to commute and I could work all days a week because yeah. the, I re, uh, I lived in Gardner or we lived in Gardner and the restaurant was in Lemonster. And so I needed the ride from them. My parents definitely weren't going to drive me. I wasn't old enough to drive. And so McDonald's was the answer to how I could work more. Yes. So I'm working there and within three months I got promoted to manager. 
shift supervisor because I was literally spinning circles around people Yeah, because that's what I would do in the kitchen. It's like everything was just so fast. And like people there were so, I don't want to call it lazy, but they just moved at just such a different pace. It was, it was immediately rewarded the hard work. Well, the problem is that now I'm 16 years old and I've got a tie on and I think I'm something. This is a problem. (laughs) (laughs) So in addition to all the stupid shit you can imagine that happens when you're a 16 year old in charge of people, they then let me go run uh, the McDonald's store. And in doing that, I would see my friends walk in and I would literally page them over like the Walmart intercom. I would page them to come to uh, the McDonald's. I would just give them food, just hand them whatever I wanted or they want. Then I would, um, (laughs) I memorized, I memorized the uh, menu item costs. And then I could do the math for the tax because at the time it was 5% tax. And so it was fairly simple math for the yeah. tax. I would do the math tax in my head. And then I had a key um, to open the register. And it had a little trick that when you did it, it made the same sound as when you hit enter on the register, that like ching sound and yeah. kicked out the drawer. Yeah. If I turned the key, it made the same sound. So I would tell them the amount. It never showed up on the thing. Yeah. But no one ever said anything. I would turn the key. They would hand me the cash. And then I did that probably once every 10 orders. And at the end of the day, however much the computer said was supposed to be in there, I would put in there. And then I would just take the rest. (laughs) So I can't even imagine what kind of like shrinkage they had in terms of like food waste, right? That they must have been reporting. But it gets crazier. So somehow, I can't remember if I was genius enough to order it or if they sent it there by mistake. It doesn't really matter either way. Remember the McDonald's game? I think they might even still do it. With like Monopoly. Little, yeah, oh, Monopoly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, that's what that. I meant. So they used to have them on the hash brown sleeves. Well, the hash brown sleeves came in like a thousand fucking thing sleeve. Yeah. We didn't sell breakfast. You did it? Not at the McDonald's Walmart or Mc- huh. Walmart McDonald's. So I've now got a thousand of these things and I just peeled, peeled all of them, all of them, all of them. <laughs> and I just gave my fam- friends and family piles of free Big Macs and fries because I had literally, cause there was two of them per thing. So I had 2000 tickets. I never, I didn't win anything big, but like, I mean, Damn. it was an unfathomable amount, amount of, of shit, shit to, give to, to give away. That's crazy. Then I would go on my shopping sprees. Yeah. So I would go. So our. Having that much money. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, no, no. It's worse than that. Much oh. worse than that. <laughs> so the where my supply closet was. So the McDonald's was like you walked right into the Walmart and it was right there on the left. Yes. My supply closet was all the way in the back, like in this in behind where like you have to go back for the warehouse for the rest of the walmart ship so inside of that there was like this construct it was hilarious because the uh, warehouse ceiling is like 30 40 50 feet and then there was like an eight foot like closet it wasn't even a refrigerator so the the um the i think there was a walk-in that was there but all the dry goods had to go back there so all the cups all the boxes and all that shit so anyway so i would go shopping in walmart I would take a cart and I would just go shopping in Walmart, put whatever I wanted in it. And then I would just walk out back because everyone knew I worked at McDonald's. I had a McDonald's shirt on. And for whatever reason, that just didn't say anything about me walking a cart full of goods into the back. Act as if, man. Dude, you have no fucking idea how people do not appreciate the power of what you just said. Yeah. It is unbelievable. You know. If you act as no, don't get me wrong. Being a tall white guy <laughs> also helps, but yeah. like, and I was also probably wearing a tie cause I was yeah. a manager. Right. So like, don't get me wrong. There are factors in yeah. this that are at play. However, I was a 16 year old kid stealing a bunch of shit. I was, I was a magician at this point. Yeah. Right. It's all about fucking illusion act as if. Yeah. So I just, I walk back there. And I'd go to the electronics section. I'd do whatever I want. DVDs, anything. Because <laughs> this is all pre the shit, yeah. right? The RFIDs or whatever. Oh. So, Because this is the mid-90s, basically. So I would go I back there. 
and I would put all my stuff, right? Here's my cups. Here's my boxes. Here's my, you know, straws, whatever. Just pile it on top. I walk it back through Walmart. Broad fucking day, like middle of the day, like middle of people yeah. milling about. It doesn't matter. Walk all the way back through as if nothing's going on. Walk back into McDonald's, unpack everything, put all the stuff that I bought into my backpack. And then I just, when I my shift was over, I just left. <laughs> I respect that. <laughs> I, I respect the boldness of it. Yes. You know? That's what I respect. It's and, obviously it's not a good thing. And I didn't need it, right? Yes. Like I wasn't starving. We we were we I mean, I was on uh, you know, welfare and wick and all that yeah. stuff for a while. So it's not like we were super well off. I'm not trying to pretend yeah. that, but we weren't starving. Yeah. Right. So we were working poor. Or working middle yeah. class. Yeah. And yeah, it was about the thrill of it, and it was more about look what I can do. Yeah. Look at me. Look at me, this kid and this billion dollar, multi-billion dollar corporation and all these grownups everywhere. And look at, look at, look at me just taking whatever I want (laughs) and you little bitches can't do a fucking thing about it. And, um, and that's because, you know, my father was an ultra authoritarian figure. Yeah. And so like I was rebelling against that, exactly. all the standard shit. And like authority and stuff. Yeah. That's how, yeah. I, well, not anymore because I'm an adult and we have to deal with consequences. But like I said, like I lacked a little discipline and I didn't like authority. So that's why I was. How yeah. Was my problem. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah. dude. Same. Yeah. <laughs> I had no discipline yeah. as a teenager. No. My brother was a totally different thing because he he's that he he still is. He's that type that like when you look at him, when you speak to him, when you address him, it's like he demands respect. And I always wanted that and stuff. And I still strive for that. But like like I said, he's like the epitome of Mexican hard worker, um, nose to the ground, does what he, he has to do for his for himself and his family. Um and that's where I get from him and my sister, but mostly from him, I get the whole like, oh, um, look at that, look at um, like I just got a ho- we just got bought a house, me and my wife. So it's like we have a closet, and I built my walk-in closet a couple of weeks ago. It took me five weeks to construct it, but the fact that I did it because it stems from my brother. Mm-hmm. Um, both my both my older siblings, both my older brother and my um, older sister, but mostly my brother, because it's like he he says, "Oh, why am I going to pay someone to um, raise my yard about two feet and a half of dirt? Let me just do it myself." So one summer, which was supposed to be a vacation for me, but one summer I would he would have. <clears throat> Um, every day, 16 yards of dirt, item, gravel, and mulch delivered to the driveway. And I would come, I would I would have to, my job was to come with the wheelbarrow, put it in the wheelbarrow, take it, dump it in the backyard in selected areas yep. for him to come later on. Didn't know how to operate a backhoe, but he rented one and he just learned by trial and error. No shit. <laughs> okay, I got it. And just leveled the whole backyard. We raised about, um, correction, a foot and a half. We raised about a foot and a half That's around a the pool. Um, put the concrete around the uh, 18 well, inches a lot, man. Yeah. And then um, by ourselves, we um, con- we constructed the fence around um, the whole the whole pool. How old were you at that house. point? I was 16. That's very impressive. Yeah. Just me and him. Just us two. It took us about a month and a half or two months because we kept running into problems. Like when we would dig a big ass hole to put the post in, there's a boulder. How can we remove the boulder? Get the backhoe or stuff like that. Or actually, let's cut the post to st- sit on the boulder and get another post, um, screw it together, and then we get the panel. So we kept running into problems. And it took us a long time to do it. And I remember I was 16 and um, we did it. Um, we're having a good summer in the pool, blah, blah, and stuff. And then the neighbor across the street con- um, con- um, dug his dug, dug a hole, constructed a pool with the fence in a matter of four days because he had two dozen laborers Whoa. working. 
and he has the money for it. And like we joke, and my brother was joking about it. Me and my brother in our driveway, we're looking over, and he's just like, "Must be nice to have money, huh?" And like joking <laughs> this up because he was a retired detective from Queens or Brooklyn, and uh, and moved upstate to Newburgh, New York. And uh, I was just like, "Damn, Gil!" And I remember I'm like, "Damn, Gil, isn't that like disheartening?" And he's just like, "A little, but you know what? We literally put blood, sweat, and tears in what we did." And we we probably saved at least eleven to fifteen grand. Yeah. And I'm like, all right. And then from that, it's just when I feel like I got a built, like, oh yeah, my my girl wants a new, like new shelves or a new table. I'm like, all right, let me let me build it. I'll build it myself. So I've already built, and I'm a flipper. I'm a hustler. So I've out of pallets, I've built four coffee tables. Um, finished them out of pallets. Out of pallets, yeah. Pallets aren't exactly clean wood. No, I would, I would um put some time in it and stuff. Um, pallets, um, you know how pallets like in the middle, yeah. it's wood. Um, middle wood, middle um wood and stuff. I would just knock out the wood in the back of it, make it into a flat table, mm-hmm. sand it, and then stain it with nice mahogany color or or a chestnut, and then buy off of Amazon. Or Craigslist, um, um, for the sake of arguing, Amazon for twenty three dollars, I'll buy hairpin lights and then um, screw them on and sell it um, for like one fifty, one eighty. The highest I paid, I, I charged for a coffee table was two hundred and stuff. That's um, nice because I also etched their name in it. Nice and stuff. The seller, the the. Um, do you have like an Etsy uh, shop or did you sell it no, on eBay? I just did it. Just, just sporadically. like people around. Yeah, just um. Like how did you get? How did you do, find people to buy them? Oh, do it. Put the pictures on on Facebook Marketplace. Oh, nice. And put the pictures on before it was let go. Now it's offer up. Okay. And then that's it. I would do that. I would find free furniture, um, paint it, sand it, flip it over. That's what I did yesterday, actually. Nice. Um, yesterday I was in a little, not in a jam, but you know, like when you have like your little freak outs. Um, because money wise or something, I'm just like, oh shit, let me. Oh, when you got a baby coming, yeah, it's always a baby. freaking out. It's yeah. always freaking out. So I was just like, you know what? Let me do something. So I contact, I not contacted, but went on Facebook yard sale, got a free, uh, free, free dresser. Um, nothing on it, just a couple of nicks. Took pictures at different angles and flipped it in like an hour. Um, and got eighty bucks for it. Then I went to Walmart, bought some food for the house, and then yeah. So like, just, I'm always, all right, which way to get money? How to do this? How to do that? How to do this and stuff? Just. That hustler mentality is, is, um, it's one of the gifts of the struggle, right? Like. Yeah. People. And I still believe I don't struggle, but. There's a, there's a really interesting. um, I heard this. I don't know if it's Chinese. I don't know where this parable comes from, but I heard it from multiple different sources within the month. And it's something like there's a farmer and um, I'm going to completely mess this up, but it's something like uh, some horses come onto his property and the um, his neighbor comes over and says, oh, look at this great fortune. And he's like, yeah, it's, who's to say what's good or bad? I know what you what right, you are, yeah. and, and then the uh, his son comes out and tries to start taming one of them. Gets knocked off, breaks his leg. Yep. Right, and he's like, oh, "Who's to say what?" It's more misfortunate. Right, no, who's to okay. say what? And then the the draft right, exactly. The yeah, army comes and he can't go, yeah. and he's like, "Oh, who's to say what's going?" And you just keep going. Yep. And I think that's I think that's really true. Like we really have no fucking idea what is good for us and what's not. Yeah. And that's well, that goes to that like whole faith mechanism, right? Yep. It's like our little puny brains and the tiny amount we know, we don't know what we you need. Know we don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. And so <clears throat> when we, you know, pity people, um, and it's not to say that like your heart shouldn't break and you shouldn't cry for others and you shouldn't pray for others, but sometimes the things that happen to us, right? Cause we've had some pretty colored pasts, you and I, Yeah. but here we are, here we are. And 
there's a lot of people in our lives who have had, you know, let's call it easier lives. Yeah. Who aren't having a nice, peaceful, loving conversation about something. Yeah. Right. Like they're terrorized or maybe killed themselves or whatever. And I think it's very interesting that if you don't tell yourself a story about what your struggle meant and you just let it be what it was and cry for what sucked, but then also love the gifts that it gave you. Mm. I think it can be really fucking powerful. Hell yeah. Cause I think there's a lot of people who get down on themselves and they tell themselves a story about what it means because of how they grew up or what happened to them. Right. We were talking earlier about like the notion of victim, victim mentality. mentality. And it's like, it just is, you know, sometimes shitty stuff happens. Yeah. That's the world. Right. Like Ukraine right now. Like what the fuck, what the actual fuck. Yeah. But it is like, I can't, I've got dozens of friends over there. So I worked for a Ukrainian company for like five years. Oh, sure. So I went over there a few times wow. and I was, I was sick to my stomach, like not sleeping, so crying really during the day. No, I'm saying like no. from the invasion, oh, like yeah. it was because I knew people who were there with their kids, like in yeah. Kiev, yeah. you know, like it was some scary shit. I mean, it still is scary shit. Most of the people I know, are out either completely or are in a, a safe enough place, but there's still, you know, people that I know that are still very much in, I don't want to say in the line of fire, but like very much at risk. But me worrying about it isn't going to do a fucking thing. Yeah. Not a single thing. And I think that balance is really hard to strike where you can feel the feeling, yeah. but only like, I don't want to say once, but like you feel the feeling yeah. and then you live life. Yeah. As opposed to like, I feel the feeling and it's like the guilt of, well, I'm not there. So I need to hold that feeling and like bathe myself in it like a, like a turkey baster. Yeah. Right. Until everybody is fine. Like, it's like, I think that's actually part of this weird Catholic guilt thing. <laughs> yeah. I really think it's a built in feature yeah. of the system. <laughs> um, because it's like, why why do i feel the need to suffer for their suffering this. like i like it's, it's, yeah. it's so they would they wouldn't want that yeah right like you reach out to the senators you do the things i try and share my stories with people like you know i try and um i just try and do what i think i can that that feels like it's in a path that is in front of me like i don't i don't believe Actually, let me say what I do believe as opposed to what I don't. I think karma gets created, bad karma. When you use your infinite power of your consciousness to adjust what the universe was going to do. So from the Big Bang forward, the universe is just doing stuff. If this, then that. It's all of nature. It's just like the seasons happen, whatever. And then we show up and we're like, actually this is going to happen. Yeah. And I think the gap between what was going to happen and what we made happen, that energy difference is what we take on as karma. And that becomes the debt that has to get paid down. And which is why we were talking about before, like the idea that you drop a rock into a still pond. That's the idea of like yeah. the disturbance in the force you've been triggered. And then you jump in the pond and try and smooth out the ripples it's a similar kind of thing. I told him get it. Anyway, I got speaking of tangents. Yeah. I tend to go off on no, my own. I totally hear you. And uh, just like you said, I also accept that because that's how I am. Like I have so many things going in my head, especially stemming from one thing. And I believe you asked me a, a, a specific question and that went on tangent. And I don't remember that question later on. We'll probably oh, yeah. go down. We'll probably <laughs> go past it but i wanted to uh stem off what you said the whole um yeah like it hurt you and you think about it but then you realize like all this worrying like what the fuck is it gonna do like i'm not gonna 
it's not going to help me or my family right now. So like, I can pray for them yeah, and I can give my heart to them and I can cry for them. Yeah. But like, but what else? But how, but for how long, like for for what perpetual at some point it's going to hurt you or impact you negatively. Yeah. Especially it it poison, it can poison you. Yes. And it's either like get on a fucking plane. Yeah. And go join the fight, or you have to become at peace with the fact that the world is constantly in chaos everywhere, right? Like right now, somebody's being raped, right now, right now, a child is being murdered, right now. And it's like, if that's always true all the time, then all of us could just be paralyzed with the grief of the fucking trauma of life. Right. There's always more than enough things to be sad about and to grieve and to be terrorized by. And so but I don't think that's why we're here. I don't think whatever this purpose is, whatever our divine nature is, I don't think it's for us to, to be in a prison of our own worry. It just doesn't feel like that's the highest thing. You know, when you look at here meant we're not meant for that no we are we are children of god which means that we are we are meant to be courageous and to be courageous is to go into the unknown and face the unknown meaning like life right the unknown is what's it like when you're born the whole thing is unknown and for the rest of your life you should be tripping into the into some semblance of the unknown one moment into the next and it's that dance between the the knowledge that you've gained and that 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 which you still don't know and it's that constant um interplay that makes life worth living it's like um there was a a really good quote something like "A, a ship is safe in harbor but that's not what ships are built for hmm so it should be out there. It should be the a fucking sail. That's it. Yeah. Just sail. Just get out there. Go f- go figure something out. Because yeah, you could you can keep your ship nice and safe and shiny, like t- t- tied up at the dock. But what the why the fuck do you have a ship? Yeah. So what are we doing here? What are we doing on this planet? I don't think it's meant to be worried out of our minds all the time. I really truly don't. I don't think so either. So, I yeah, I don't think so either. Um, I uh, it's crazy because I was saying with that notion or that idea, um, don't sweat the small stuff. Yeah, and like I always use that with everything, and I think it's enhanced more because of my job. Mm-hmm. Um, because oh, yeah, we didn't talk about that at all. Oh, what yeah. do you do for work? What's your vocation, <laughs> my friend? Um. I'm a biohazard technician and layman terms. Um, I used, I, I still love saying this because this is how I was told. So when somebody decides to commit suicide and blows their head off with a shotgun, uh, after the coroners and the cops come and take the body, I go in there with a crew of three to go clean it up. Yes. So I have to imagine how long you've been doing that? Uh, two years and three months. So I have to imagine more than zero times that has created some kind of an imprint on you. Um, yes and no. Yes, because it has, and no, because it's. I think about it as, oh, I'm a glorified cleaner. That's it. But yes, because it's um, impacted me twice. Um, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna say what towns and stuff, but I'm just gonna say in one instance this person um killed himself in the bathroom with his wife and kid in the next room um they um blah blah we're there to clean it up i get told it was just me and my supervisor at the time my supervisor asked me to go um get him pizza and cigarettes i come from because i always have my lunch with me and i'm like all right cool it's break so i go i come back and i see this lady I'm just walking outside and I'm like, damn, it's fucking neighbors, man. And uh, it's not the neighbors. It's the significant other who's just 
like lost her, her husband, yeah. lost her, lost her significant other, and uh, she's telling me like, "Oh yeah, like I knew from the jump she's just trying to get her mind off of what just happened by focusing on an animal." I said, oh, my animal was in the house. I don't know where this animal is. And I said, don't worry. The animal's resourceful. They're cool. They're, they'll come back. Don't worry. And she was still trembling, trembling. And she started to cry. And I didn't know what the fuck to do. And all I could say was, I'm good at hugs. You want a hug? And I just fucking hugged her. And holy shit, I've never felt anyone, I've ne- like, I've been cold, I've, I've trembled before, I've been like, oh, you know, your teeth rattling, but I've never felt someone tremble and convulse like that, and that, like, teared me up and broke a little bit of my spirit, because I'm like, geez, like, oh, man, like, I hope she's okay, and then I was like, people go through shit like this all the time, that's fucking ridiculous, I, yeah, and, so and I think cry. I think you might have given her the greatest gift anyone could ever give somebody. Do you think? I Why? do think so because I believe – remember what I was saying earlier that around like the original sin idea when you're a kid, you don't know what to do with your emotions and so you trap them and you store them inside yeah. you? So when you get triggered, when someone says something to you and all of a sudden you're saying something yeah. that you didn't mean to say – that's coming from a place of something that you stored in you because you couldn't deal with it. What she had in her, the vibration was that it was all energy is vibration. Yes. I believe that. So she was trembling like that because what had happened to her was the equivalent. Have you ever seen a gong? Like, yeah. a, like a real one, a really big, like in real life, yes. they're fucking huge. Right. That's and when you, messy. when you, and it's, when yeah. you see that, that was the, that's basically what happened to her. And so she was trembling like that. And when you held her in the same way that when you get static electricity in the mm-hmm. winter time, and when you discharge that, it's gone. How do you feel after? Like normally you can it's feel so like that prickly, like yeah. your hair is up almost right. And then you discharge, you feel great. And yeah, the end of your finger might have hurt a little bit, but like the rest of you now feels incredible. So I think you let her discharge what something that could have possibly given her cancer. It would have been so much energy. If she didn't let that out of her, she would have carried that around probably until she died. And it may have been very premature because that's, that's a non-trivial thing that occurred, right? Especially with a kid there. Yeah. And now you've got to figure out like what to do with yeah. your life. Yeah. So to have had the blessing of a man who could be there to say, I'm good at hugs. I didn't know what to say. It was, <laughs> just, the, yeah. it, what, was the thing. What you said was the thing to say. Yeah. What you did is you listened to your intuition yeah. and with an open heart and you, and you gave a woman a miraculous gift. And I think, What's interesting about these kinds of journeys is putting our our souls through the um, the proverbial fire, if you will. I think it, uh, what it cleans out, it allows you to have the space to hold other people's pain. Because not everybody could have given that hug. Not everybody could even look that woman in the eye. Not everybody could even have your job, right? Like there's multiple layers of space you had to have in your heart in order for all of that to happen. And that's pretty fucking special. Thanks, man. Um, I hope I helped her. (laughs) And what I mean by special is I don't mean like the way we told everybody in the eighties and nineties that everybody was special, which means nobody's special (laughs) to me. Special is something that is rare and pointed towards something divine. Mm. And you are definitely fucking rare. Nobody can dispute that. (laughs) And I, I look at you as a, as a very divine being. I think there's, there's few people who I've come across where, I mean, you beat the shit out of me. That was how I met Don't you. Say it like that. No, but I mean, like, 
you beat that's me. how we, i know but like we met right like yeah. we met through physical violence yes and for me to be instantaneously drawn to you even even immediately following that because as now hear me out on this too yes. you are a sweet man your yes. trainer was not as sweet to me no. at the time <laughs> Right. And so, but I could, but I could hear that too. Yeah. Right. And so you have to imagine how improbable the combination of those things is. Right. So I'm broken. I've been broken and beaten in front of, I think I might've had, I don't know how many dozens of people there. Yeah. And so in front of my family, my friends, my wife, my coworkers, yeah. and my white collar asked you. And, um, and I, I am humiliated and ashamed because the things he was saying were true. I don't remember. Well, even, let's just say, I let's just take, let's ass. take, let's take a sample, right? Yeah. He just was calling out how shitty my boxing was. It was just a factual statement, but like all of that combined, you would not put together and say, let me, let me bring this man into my life. Right. Yes. In whatever capacity. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's a testament to how, um, how open your heart is that it can be read by somebody who at the time I was spiritually, I was stiff as a board. Like I was wooden. I was, I was unable to sense anything. So it's even more, it says even more about it actually to me. So I don't know what you think of yourself. Um, but I'll, I'll just share with you that I think you're a pretty fucking amazing dude. Thank you so much, man. I honestly value that, and I love you for that. Thank I love you, you too, buddy. Yeah, it's crazy because like I hear that, and it's just I I try not to not to think of it. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. I really do appreciate that. Like honestly, it, it touches my heart. And then, but like in the back of my head, I'm hearing my siblings um, or I'm hearing something saying, oh, don't let it get to your head, blah, blah. Don't, don't let it get don't to your head. Like this, you know, or don't, um, or you're still a piece of shit. Um, uh, ah, yeah. yeah. And because like, I'll be honest, like I still, and like, I don't know, um, me, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So the people who are on my Facebook, my Instagram, all this stuff, I feel like they generally know me. So when I post stuff or when I write and I post stuff or I put memes, um, some people might disagree with it, but you know, it's just whatever, or, you know, it's the you, truth. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's what you're feeling. It's the truth of what I'm feeling. And there's no ill will or malice coming out of it. So people should know my heart and I feel people know my heart, but I still feel like when people say that and stuff i'm just like i'm still in awe because i still kind of feel like sh like i'm a piece of shit like i still feel like um and also like sorry because i'm emotional teddy bear i'm a cancer i'm sensitive fuck you I'm a, I'm a, <laughs> so i might cry but i still feel like i don't know the shit that i did when i was younger or the stuff the trials and tribulations i went through i did because of me stuff like uh i was homeless um, because I got kicked out of my, my house that I lived with my brother. Oh man, it's my fault. Like I shouldn't have done that. Like what the hell? Am I how old were you? Um, how old am I now? No, how old were you? Uh, I got kicked out countless times. So I was <laughs> at the time that you're so referring to right at now. At the time I'm referring to, um, I was 20, 20, 20. Yeah. 20. Because during that time, my, I remember my brother-in-law, who's like, I call him my brother, because my sister-in-law's little brother moved up um to um, Newburgh with us. And he went to the same high school, same college as me. And uh, I remember I got my license. Um, so I was like 20, 20, no, oh shit, no, I'm lying. I was 22, because I got my license at 22, 23, because I live in New York, right. cabs, trains, buses. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was 22 and stuff. What when the instance that I'm talking about when I got kicked out, you know, I still think like, oh man, it was my fault. I should have done what he told me to do, or um, or 
when I got kicked out of my sister's house in, in Adderborn, oh man, I'm, I was a piece of shit. Like, what fucking child eats a box of yodels and leaves the, <laughs> leaves the rappers in there, you know? Um, I don't know. I just think about stuff like that. Or like, a major thing, which I'm probably, I'm definitely going to start crying, was uh, why aren't you strong enough, Anthony? Um, because uh, my mom, when she passed away, I found her. I gave her CPR. I, I still will always remember the feeling of her cold lips when I gave her CPR. Um, and uh, um, oh, man. Uh, I, uh, so let me get to my point and then I'll say the story. Um, she passed away, um, blah, blah. Um, and, uh, leading up to it, she was kind of lethargic and stuff. And I would ask my sisters, um, because I never, I wasn't not man enough, but I wasn't like, I didn't take initiative and I was like, Oh, Joey, Lizette, like, well, mostly Joey. Oh yeah. Joey the one who disowned me. Oh, Joey, like, mom's like this. Maybe we should take her back to the hospital. Oh, no, it's the meds. It's the meds. It just puts her on her ass. It's the meds. So I just believe them because in my head, I'm like, I'm the little brother. They know more than me. I don't know shit. Just, just, l- l- just listen to the man thing. And boom, you know, it wasn't the meds. It was something going in her body, something that happened to her kidneys failing or something. I should have taken it to the hospital. I shouldn't have listened. Like, what the fuck, Anthony? And I always think, like, uh, um, I after that, what, the biggest lesson after that was uh, um, just do what the fuck you want, Anthony. Um, don't listen to people. Um, don't look, not like look up to people, but like who you think is in charge Maybe they're not in charge. Just research it yourself. That's why, not just from that, before I was, but mostly because of that, I'm really strongly opinionated. And if you were my boss, sorry, but if you were my boss or person of higher stature and you said, oh, Anthony, do this, man. Do, do it like this. I'm always asking, oh, why? Not just because of what I'm saying. Like, I'm always going to question, but also because, like, why? I want to know the intricacies. Right. I want to know why, you know? Um, and it might come off as like um, pompous, but it's coming off of like, um, I want to follow my heart. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just follow you with just ignorance. I want to follow you because you gave me a correct, a correct thing or a correct reason why to do this. And that's why I kind of still like that reinforced that I'm anything soda and I do what the fuck I want. Um, because I honestly believe or I honestly feel like I could have probably given my mom more time to live, you know? And, uh, or if, if I took it to the doctor sooner, um, they would have found something and given her more time to live, you know? And, uh, yeah, just shit like that. Um, I do take solace though. I do take solace though that the doctors, this one guy, um, a male doctor, came out to me and he said, "Oh, you gave you gave your mother CPR, you gave your you gave your mom, you gave your family more time for them to see her, or to for them grieve. to talk to her yeah. and grieve, because uh, it was a Sunday. My oldest sister was in Texas with her family, um, on vacation, and it was me, Joey, and her." fucking spineless on um, my husband and uh we were watching walking dead and uh we left her house because we did laundry at her house um all the sister whatever um we did our laundry at her house we're leaving i have my car joey has her car and i'm like oh yeah you're gonna go over to mom's before we go home and she's like yeah 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 never does and then me because i'm me and i'm the baby i want to go say um good night to my mom before i go to bed and then uh, walk in. Um, she uh, um, she's just in her bed, and uh, I'm like, I'm nudging her. I'm like, mom, mom, mom. And crazy me, cause uh, the week prior to that, um, we found. Um, so my mom worked for foster care. I'm adopted, and I'm the only kid she adopted and stuff. 
her angel. And she adopted me. I was with her from 11 days old. And she chose, no, not chose, like, oh, she finally decided. But she adopted me right after my car accident because she know, because mm. I feel, and I know, like, oh, man, I grieved over this baby for so long and I love him so much. I'm, he's going to be mine, you know? That's how I see it in mm-hmm. my head. But anyways, um, so uh, our foster sister that was with us, who taught me how to read, Veronica, she left, she left our, our care when I was 12. She taught me how to read. She was my sister. That's why I say I have four sisters. Um, and then we found her on Facebook. So um, my sister Joey found her on Facebook, told me the information. I told my mom, I'm like, mom, we're going to go down to the Bronx to go see her. So so we're down in the Bronx. We're at my godmother's mom's house, Juanita, the one with the van. And uh, um, so my mom wants a haircut. Her basement stairs are, are stone. And you know how older people are. They're stupid in the sense that I'm going to do what I want, whatever, <laughs> blah, blah, and stuff like that, instead of listening. I'm not blind or I'm not going half deaf or whatever. I have 92 and 91-year-old grandparents who live on the second floor of their house right now. Whew. And yeah. they refuse to let anybody live with them. It's like, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think we know how this play ends, yeah, but okay. Exactly. It's your life. Yeah. So I told my mom, let me go down before you to the basement. She's like, oh, okay. As she's fucking walking down. And I'm like, damn it. So I'm walking down with her because she's she's partially blind. Sometimes she misses the last step. She misses the last two steps, swings and bashes her head in the concrete, in the in on the stone wall, the concrete. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm mad, but I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, panicking, but I'm mad that you're not listening to me and stuff like that. I'm like, that's it. Um like, like, um, so I panicked. She's okay. Whatever. Um, Juanita cuts her hair. There's a cut. Um, there's a gash on my fucking mom's head. And I'm like, that's when I just get mad. I'm like, what the fuck? That's it. We're going back up to Massachusetts right now. So we could go to the hospital. Cause I'm still young. I, well, not still young. I'm 20, 22, 23, but I'm still, I'm still ignorant. I don't know what to do. So all I'm thinking is, if you get sick in another state, let me rush you over to our home state so I could take you because I don't know shit right. like that. Yeah, I'm stupid. Um, ignorant. I, ignorant. So I was just like, that's it. We're going up to Mass. So I'm driving. I, so I'm kind of mad. I'm I'm in, in traffic on um, Bay Plaza. I see Bay Plaza. Bay Plaza is this plaza in, in the Bronx. Everyone knows who will listen to this and, know, and live in the Bronx. Um, by Bay Plaza in the Bronx. My sister Veronica, who we just found on Facebook, um, works at Macy's in the Bronx in in that in Bay Plaza, and then I just chilled. Like I was just like, you know what? Stop being mad. Mom came down to go see Veronica, so let's go see her. So I text her while she's working. We go see her. Boom. We hug. Have an awesome time. We hung out for 10, 15 minutes, and then we left. Brought her back up. That was a uh, Sunday, and then. Took it to the hospital. She started, I would say she started deteriorating. Um, I tell my sister's story, blah, blah, all that stuff. Take to the hospital, they give her meds. She's just chilling. And I honestly believe she started dying that week. And what some something went in my head. I'm like, let me start listening to her heartbeats. So like I started listening to her heartbeats. And then like it started gradually getting less. And I'm like, and that's when I was, and she started getting lethargic. So that's when I told my sister Joey, like, hey, like. She should go back to the house, but no, it's okay. It's the meds. It's the meds. It's not gonna it knock you on her ass. It's the meds and stuff. And I'm like, okay, me being stupid, me being ignorant, I'm like, okay. So then fast forward to Sunday after Walking Dead, I go over. My mom, um, I immediately start crying because that's my mommy. Um, and uh um I start speaking to her in, I well, originally I just always speak to her in Spanish. I'm like, um, oh, mommy, mommy, mommy. Mommy, despétate, despétate, wake up. Um, es tu hijo, Antonio. Um, it's your son, a- Anthony. Antonio is Anthony in Spanish. And then like, I just remember she just said, Antonio, smiling. And uh, she just closed her eyes. And then uh, I was panicking. Um, I called my sister, Joanne. I called my sister, Joey. And she starts freaking out. She's like, call the cops, call the cops. And I'm like, shit, I should call the cops. So I called the cops. Um, ambulance coming, and then I just start giving the CPR. 
Um, I hung up the phone with them actually and I started giving a CPR. Um, and then I will never ever forget the, that feeling, give a CPR. And I felt her heart rate boom, boom, boom and stuff. And then cops came, ambulance, all that stuff. Fast forward. How so, did you know CPR? Um, I worked with people with mental illness and disability, with disability at the time, not illness. I worked with people with mental disability at the time. So um, I was CP, CPR and first aid certified. And I just loved knowing the fact that I could do that and I could save a life um, if need be. And uh, I'll tie into that later on. Um, but uh, I did that and then they took it to the ambulance. And I remember I almost fought the neighbors, these old neighbors, because they were just looking at us and looking at what's happening. And I was like, what the fuck is wrong with these guys? So I get out the car, my sister grabs me, her, her spineless husband at the time was cool. He goes out to talk to them. I don't know what he said, but they start walking away. And then um, we leave to go follow the ambulance to the hospital. Um, go to the hospital, fast forward to Monday, I call my siblings and stuff. We can't get a hold of our oldest sibling. He's at because she's in Texas. And then I get a hold of my brother, Gail, who's like my Superman, my first ever dad, technically. And uh, I'm just like, yo, something's wrong and stuff like that. So he's like, okay, all right, I'll be there. Um, doesn't come until Monday night because he still kind of did a half day at work. Um, and then uh, he came. And in my head, I just remember telling my godmother this story the other day. Um, in my head, I'm like, okay, Gil's going to be here. It's going to be all right. Gil's going to be here. It's all right. He's my Superman. He's, it's okay. Even my, even though my Superwoman's down and out right now, my mom, it's okay. Gil's going to be here. And then I just remember I was crying the whole time, but I was okay because I kept thinking Gil's going to be here. My Superman's going to be here. And uh, I remember Gil being there. I was okay. I was smiling. Gil goes, uh, goes in talks with the doctor, sees my mom, and comes back out. And uh, I see his eyes, he was just, he started to cry. And uh, um, I've never, I've seen my brother cry three times in, in his life, three times. The first time was on again. <laughs> when Liv Tyler puts her, uh, puts her hand on Bruce Willis. To this day, he's like, no, I was the AC. I was sitting with AC one. Um, but yeah. That's so, funny. Uh, um, <laughs> So, yeah, so that time I was just like, at that instance, I was like, wow, that was the notion. You know how, like, the notion, like, kids, like, think their parents are super. Yeah, super you think parents. people are invisible, that invincible. When, invincible. That was when I was like, no, I don't have a Superman. I don't have a Superwoman. 